Data sheet practices, how to evaluate the good and the bad. Hi, I'm Marty Johnson. Today we're gonna to talk about good data sheet practices and how you can evaluate between good and bad practices that are in the data sheets in the additive manufacturing industry today. We're gonna to start off looking at the good data sheet practices. The good data sheet practices are looking at complete data sets, showing all the data in a table so that you can evaluate that material. You wanna look at that data and hopefully that data is set up per industry standards. So you want that data backed up by testing done per ASTM, SAE, ISO, UL standards. When you have that data in your data sheet, you want industry standard data. As you go through and look at that, one thing that's really helpful is understanding the isotropic data. Isotropic data is really helpful in the additive manufacturing industry because all of the different ways that we build in this technology. So if you have isotropic data, you can take advantage of how you set up parts and do things like that. So you can take full advantage of that technology and that material. And lastly, data really should be conditioned per ASTM and ISO standards. And the reason for this is that you can compare data and come back and look at data again. You can compare data per industry standards with injection molds. So it really gives you the opportunity to go in and understand what that data means time and time again with a baseline that's set because you've conditioned those properties. So these are really good data sheet practices. You can go to the 3D Systems website, look on the materials page, and there's a series of videos there that you can really go in depth looking at these different places in the data sheet and what that data means. When we go to look at the bad data sheets, and I really don't wanna say bad, let's call it be careful data sheet practices because sometimes the specific uh, way that data is presented or the way that it was tested may be looking at a very specific uh, application that somebody's doing and really that should be called out if that's happening. But one of the places we really see a lot of variation in data sheets across this additive industry is the speeds in which people pull their tensile bars. The ASTM requirement calls for five millimeters per minute and if the part does not fail then you go to 50 millimeters per minute and that would be your pull rate. For 3D systems, that's absolutely what we use and we use that per the ASTM standard. Now that's not written on our current data sheets and you'll probably see that in the future just so we can clear up any confusion that may occur on that. But when you go look at that, be sure your ASTM standards are not at 10 millimeters. If they are, look and question that. Look, but when you compare that data one-to-one, -one, look at that speed, understand what you're comparing because what happens is your elongation at break can really move depending on that speed. Next, we're gonna take a look at FR and FST materials. If you look at that on the data sheet, that should come specified with the wall thickness. The typical wall thickness you're gonna see is a two and a half to three millimeter wall thickness because typically that's what you're gonna see for covers. A lot of times for covers, this is a light cover that would be for an aerospace application and the FST. So you would wanna look at the FAR 12 second or 60 second value and see what is the thickness. If you wanna see that, down at what's a typical thickness, two to three millimeters is what you're generally looking for. If you're looking at cases, same kind of thing. A lot of times you have cases that are done per V0. In those typical cases, you're gonna see two and three millimeter kind of wall thicknesses. Of course, there's applications that will call for thinner, there's applications that will call for thicker. But when you look at your data sheet and evaluate that and you compare those materials, be real sure you go see where that ULV0 rating is set per the thickness. Another place we wanna look is we wanna look at the moisture uptake or the, the 24 hour water absorption because you really need to understand when comparing different data sheets, how was that measured? Was it measured soak? Was it measured per ASTM methods uh, where you go through 24 hours and you go in and check uh, the amount of water absorption that that particular part, that test part actually went per ASTM standards. So when you compare the different materials and the different data sheets and you see that water absorption, you can tailor your design to either work around that water absorption, work with it, or go to a different material. That's why that is so important that you understand that data point. Another place you can go look to look at that water absorption to really understand how that works within your material is to look at chemical compatibility or automotive fluid compatibility charts. Because when you go there, you can look at things like automatic transmission fluid. How does that actually affect the part and the part's mechanical properties. And typically when you have chemical compatibility, you'll have distilled water in there that you can go directly look. 
Hopefully you have a little more than mass uptake. Hopefully you can go in and look and see uh, how does that affect my mechanical properties. It's really important to know and understand that for your design and for your application. When you go and look at long-term environmental stability, you're not gonna see that everywhere. Even injection mold plastics, a lot of time, will be formulated specifically for long-term environmental stability. So at 3D Systems, when we talk about production plastics, we always include the discussion on long-term environmental stability. And so when you have that, you're gonna to have to go in and look at the charts and how that was tested. There's specific ASTM tested that's done in weatherometers. When you go through, look at your weatherometers and look at your reference tables when you look at that so you understand how far did I go out? If I test something to 96 hours, that really doesn't give me a lot of information. When I test something to 357 hours, is that good, is that bad? However, if you understand the reference chart, for instance, looking at indoor long-term stability, 357 hours equates to about five years. And so that gives you a really good understanding of where this material starts to degrade and how far it can continue based on how you wanna add that to your application. So when you're comparing data sheets and you go through and look at what information do I have? How do I compare this to another data sheet? And if I don't understand that information, always ask. Go in and ask your salesperson, go in and ask your applications representative and see if you can really understand where that data is so that you can make good decisions about your applications with your materials so that you're successful in what you're doing. So let's go to the mailbox and take a look at some of the different questions that were sent in. And we had a really good question from someone that came in that was looking at the flex modulus chart. The flex modulus chart that we showed in the vlog was on figure four. We do have this for selective laser centering, for stereolithography and for multi-jet printing. So you'll see those here and we'll go in and give you a look where you can go in and see the different materials on the different vlogs. And as we get those, one day we can make these downloadable so that you'll have these and you can use those as a filter to kind of go through our materials and make good decisions. So thanks a lot and be sure to send your other questions in to Marty on Materials.